I invite you to take your Bibles this morning, open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12. We're going through the Gospel of Mark here on Sunday mornings, and we're in chapter 12. And this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 18 down to verse 27. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 18 down to verse 27. And I would have you to stand, please, as I read Scripture with you. I'm going to read a few of these verses here. Can we stand for the reading of Scripture? Then came unto him the Sadducees, which say, There is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and they first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed. And the third likewise And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? This is God's holy word today for us. So that you may be seated. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your inspired word. We learn from the example of our Lord, our Master, how important it is that we rightly divide the word of truth. Help us to learn this today and many other things in this passage. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my sermon today is Why Theology Matters. Why Theology Matters. Now, sometimes when you mention the word theology in a church, people's eyelids already start to get heavy because they think, you know, theology is something boring and that we're going to, you know, go through a whole litany of things in a systematic theology book and probably not pertinent to me. But that's, that's not really what theology is all about. Theology gets a bad rap. Theology actually just simply means the study of God. And there's nothing more exciting than the study of God. And I would say this, every sermon has theology in it. It's either good theology or it's bad theology. And I would also say that every person is a theologian. Whether you realize it or not, you are a theologian because you have a theology. The question is, are you a good theologian or are you a bad theologian? Because you're all theologians. And so... It's important that we have good theology. But I think that the church today in America suffers from bad doctrine or bad theology. And bad theology leads to bad living. Because what you believe will determine how you behave. Paul was constantly warning Timothy to be on the alert about this. He was constantly warning him about bad doctrine. In fact, in 2 Timothy 1.13, he said to Timothy, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Hold fast to those sound words. The word sound is from the Greek word hygieneo, where we get the word hygiene, and it simply means healthy or health-giving, health-giving words. Good, solid theology is health-giving, spiritually healthy for the church. Bad theology is the opposite. And the problem today is that the church is no longer uh, getting good theology in a lot of places. Paul warned about this again to Timothy. He said that many, uh, he said, for there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, same word there, sound, healthy doctrine, but according to their own desires, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. And so Paul told Timothy, there's a need to rebuke Uh, those who teach bad theology. Now, no one did this better than our Lord Jesus. Throughout his earthly ministry, he was constantly being confronted by religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, with their bad theology, where Jesus would have to correct them. And we see this in the gospel many times. And we're going to see this here in our passage today. The Sadducees are going to come to him with some bad theology, and Jesus has the need to correct them. And what I want you to see from this passage today are five reasons why good, sound theology matters. Here's the first one, number one. It matters because many have misinterpreted the Scripture. Many have misinterpreted the Scripture. Look down at verse 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, 
And they asked him, saying, so there came the Sadducees to him. Now, let me give you the time frame. This is the Passion Week of Jesus' ministry, the last week of his life. This is on Tuesday. On Sunday, he rode into Jerusalem to proclaim himself the Messiah. On Monday, he cleansed the temple. On Tuesday, he came back and he took control of the temple, and he's teaching in the court of the Gentiles. And the, uh, the religious leaders came and said, why, what authority do you do this? And Jesus gave a parable about the owner of the vineyard showing that the owner of the vineyard is the father. He's the son, the heir to the vineyard. He has full authority from God to do what he's doing. They were only the religious leaders, tenants in the vineyard, while Jesus was the, the, the son of the owner. And that parable made the religious leaders look really bad, and so they're really angry. So now they're trying to do everything they can to find fault with Jesus that they might get him. They want to kill him at this point, and the hostility towards Christ is mounting greater and greater with each passing hour. And so they try to, they try to impale him on the horns of a dilemma. Uh, they did it po- with a political question back in verse number 14 of chapter 12 um, when they said, you know, uh, when they, they were asking Jesus about a political thing about Caesar in verse 14, and notice that where it says, when they co- were come, they said unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. Thou regardest not the person of men, but teach us the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Should we pay our taxes? And Jesus responded by saying, give to, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. And he kind of shut them up and made them look bad with that brilliant response. Now they come at him with a theological question, hoping to trap him. And in verse 18, who comes to him? It's the Sadducees. Now, who are the Sadducees? They were the religious leaders of the day that were part of the Sanhedrin, but we could say that they were the theological liberals of the day because they did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in the resurrection. One country preacher said that's why they were sad, you see, because they did not believe in life after death. They also didn't believe in the spirit world. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe that God was sovereign over history. They were the rationalists. They were the theological critics. Josephus, the historian, said of them, but the doctrine of the Sadducees is this, that souls die with the bodies. That's what they believe. When your body dies, your soul dies, your dies, that's it, it's over. And the, another thing about the Sadducees that is important to note in that for this dialogue that we see here is that they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. That was their canon. They didn't have uh, 29 books or 66 books. or They believed that their canon was five books. The first five books of the Bible were the only ones that they believed. That was the Pentateuch. That was the only scripture they accepted. And they thought they could entangle, entangle Jesus over the doctrine of the resurrection. They felt like that there was scriptural proof that there was no resurrection. And they come to Jesus with this passage of scripture out of Deuteronomy, one of the first five books of the Bible, and they bring to him a question that they think that he cannot answer. Look at it. Look in verse 19. Master, Moses wrote unto us, if a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children that his brother should take a wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Uh, And so they're quoting here from Deuteronomy 25 on the custom of liveret marriage. You say, what's a liveret marriage? It's the custom that back in this day that if a man married a woman and he, he did not pass along a son, that if he died, then the second brother, the next brother would marry the widow and they would have a child And that first child would be named after the deceased man. This was a way of kind of preserving the family name or an heir to the deceased man. And so this was kind of the custom, and this was codified in the law of Moses back in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, the Sadducees thought that that one passage alone proved in their minds that there was no resurrection. And so they bring to Jesus this scenario that they think proves that there's no resurrection. What's the scenario? Look at verse 20. Now, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed. And the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. And so this is the scenario. 
and they present this hypothetical situation. Here's a man that marries a wife. He, doesn't, he dies without leaving a, a child. So the second brother marries her, and he also dies without leaving a, a child or an heir. And then likewise, the third brother, all the way down to seven. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of nervous if I'm the seventh brother. I mean, what is she feeding these guys, right? This is kind of a hypothetical situation here. And you can see how kind of crazy this whole situation is. But these are the Sadducees are making up this scenario that in their minds proves that there's no resurrection. But now here's the question. Look down in verse number 23, the question that they ask. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. So in their mind, there could be no resurrection or life after death because if there were, she would be a wife to seven husbands. And that would make her a polygamist. They could not imagine a woman trying to please seven husbands at the same time and perhaps a fight and a battle over whose wife she would be in the resurrection. So in their minds, this scriptural command uh, did not allow for any life after death death. But the Sadducees made a problem. They had a problem here in interpreting Scripture. You know what it is? They, they did something that happens a lot today in theology. It happens a lot in seminaries and churches where that rather than interpreting the Scripture correctly, they read into the Scripture something that's not there. And the technical terms, and I don't want to bore you with technical terms, but the technical terms, if you were my seminary class, I would tell you the technical terms are eisegesis and exegesis. You say, what in the world is that? Eisegesis is from the word isis, which means you read into the Bible, you're reading into it rather than exegesis pulling out from it. When you exegete a passage, you're, you're, you're letting the Bible speak for itself. You're not reading into it your preconceived notions or beliefs. That happens a lot. And so you have to know the difference between eisegesis and exegesis. You heard about the seminary student that they had, he went to seminary. The church gave him a grand going away party Sunday night after church. But two weeks later, he showed up in church and the pastor said, what, what happened? He said, well, I went to seminary and I sat in class and the professor got up and he started talking about an extra Jesus. And he said, you know, I was offended by that, and I decided not to go back. He said, but then I thought, you know, let me just give him another chance. He said, well, then why are you here? He said, well, then when I went back to class the second time, he got up and he said, I is a Jesus, you know. <laughs> he said, I couldn't live with that. So we need to understand these terms, right? I is a Jesus is when you have a belief in your mind, and you read the Bible through that lens of what you already believe. You see, the Sadducees did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in the resurrection. And that preconceived belief that they had colored their interpretation of that Old Testament passage. That's not how you interpret the Bible. You have to lay aside your presuppositions. You have to lay aside your, your, your previous belief system and allow the Bible to speak for itself. People do that all the time. They do it with God. They have a preconceived notion of what God ought to be, and that's how they had a tendency to read the Bible that way. They make up a God in their mind, but unfortunately, it's not the God of the Bible. God has revealed himself in Scripture. We have to correctly interpret the Bible and let God be God the way he has revealed himself in Scripture. So exegesis is taking out of the Bible exactly what it says. That's why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's dangerous to misinterpret the Scripture. Peter said that a lot of people do it to their own destruction, and we see that happening today. People interpret the Bible the way they want, they, what they think it should mean, the way they want it to read. And it, the Bible becomes like a wax nose where you can shape it in any way you want. And that's dangerous. And the Sadducees made this mistake. It matters. Sound theology matters because 
many have misinterpreted the scripture. But number two, it matters because it's important to Jesus. Look at verse 24. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? Notice that Jesus answers them directly. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's very forthright. He confronts their errors. He says, you do err. You are wrong. And in verse 27, he says, you, are, you err greatly. You're greatly mistaken. You don't know the Scripture. You don't know what you're talking about. Jesus wasn't intimidated by their ordination from the Israeli religious association. He wasn't, he wasn't intimidated by the letters after their name. There's a lot of people that have all of that, and they're twisting the Scripture. Jesus said, you don't know what you're talking about. And notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, well, you know, the Scriptures aren't really clear on this, and uh, no matter, I, I can understand why you uh, have this confusion, because after all, the Old Testament was written 1,500 years ago. It's a long, old book. He doesn't say that. And the reason I bring that up is because that's the argument I hear sometimes from certain scholars who want to appear educated. They say, well, we, we're not so arrogant as to think we could know exactly what the Bible means. After all, it was a document that was written so long ago. Well, that's a backhanded attack against the Scripture. Because if you can't understand what it means, what good is it? What good is it if we can't understand what the Bible says? We believe in the perspicuity of Scripture, or we would say the clarity of Scripture, that the Bible is clear and it's simple. Now, there are certain parts of it that are difficult, but with a fair amount of labor and work, you can know exactly what was intended when that was written. And so Jesus doesn't say, well, it was written so long ago we can't know what it means. No, he, he never blamed their lack of understanding on the Scripture. He blames it on them. He says, you do err. This is your mistake. He doesn't say, you know, it doesn't really matter what you guys believe as long as you're sincere. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, well, you know, you guys are my brother, even if you don't really understand and you don't believe in the resurrection. No. He doesn't say, I respect your views. Everyone's entitled to his opinion. He doesn't say any of that. He says, no, you are wrong. And you don't know the Scripture. And therefore, you don't know the power of God. This is a serious deviation from orthodoxy, a serious mistake that you're making. This leads to the third point. It matters because your salvation depends on it. Because again, look what Jesus says, you do err because you, you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. When Jesus said the power of God, what was he talking about? The power of God was the power to resurrect the dead. And that's salvation power. Do you realize that salvation is resurrection power? That's what happened to us when we got saved. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I was spiritually dead. And you know what? At salvation, God made me alive. He quickened me. He made me alive. He did the same thing for you. And that same resurrection power that gave us life at the moment that we trusted Christ is that same resurrection power that will bring our dead bodies out of that grave and give us a resurrected, glorified body. All of our salvation is tied into this resurrection power. This is not a small mistake or small error. To not believe in the resurrection is a serious error. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now, there are some doctrines that you can be wrong on and still be saved. You can be wrong on spiritual gifts and still be saved. You could be wrong on the timing of the second coming of Christ and still be saved. You could be wrong on the mode of baptism and still be saved. But if you're wrong on the resurrection, you can't be saved. That's one of the pillars of our faith. And so this was a serious deviation. Number four, sound theology matters because it will determine how we face life and death. Notice what Jesus affirms. I love verse 25. Look at it. For when they shall rise from the dead, I love when Jesus says that, not if they will rise, when they will rise. To the Sadducees, there is a resurrection day. And when they shall rise, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like as the angels which are in heaven. Think about that one statement. In that one statement, Jesus confirms the truth of the resurrection. He confirms the existence of heaven. He confirms the reality of a new life 
after this earthly life in heaven. And he says that you do err because you don't know the scripture. And then he says, those who resurrect will be as the angels in heaven. They won't be an angel in heaven. Every once in a while we'll hear about someone say, well, you know, they became an angel. No, friend, you don't become an angel when you die. I don't want to be an angel after I die. You know why? Angels are supposed to serve me up there in heaven. They're my servants. They're your servants. They're they're servants to those who are heirs to salvation. You have a much higher position in heaven than angels. You become a glorified saint of God in heaven. And several things Jesus said about this new life in heaven, it'll be a beautiful life. He said there will be neither marriage nor, the, n- n- marriage nor given in marriage. Marriage is a beautiful institution, but it's an earthly, temporary institution. In heaven, we're gonna, not going to be a need have a need for any of those things. He said, we'll be as the angels. The angels don't marry in heaven. They have a glorified body. They shine with the glory of God. They never die. All that will be true of a person who resurrects. Now, for some people, the thought of not being able to be married in heaven to your present spouse, that is a burden for some people. Some people have asked me about that. For others, it's not a burden. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> and some will say, you know, I can't imagine heaven with my spouse there. I'm not married. But let me just t- say this, my friend. In heaven, all of the relationships there in heaven will be perfect. And there will be perfect love and joy. And we'll not have any of the baggage that we have here in these sinful bodies that we dwell in. It will be a perfect relationship there in heaven. And I'll be able to love my wife perfectly in heaven, finally the way she deserves to be loved there in heaven. Uh, my love is less than perfect. And so it's, it's whatever you think is good here on earth, do you think it's going to be less good in heaven? Whatever God has planned for us there in heaven is going to be so much more wonderful than what we have here on earth. But also we remain, we keep our identity. I mean, that's very clear when when Jesus refers to the passage, look in verse 26, as touching the dead, that they rise not. Have you not read in the book of Moses how that in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? That tells me a lot right there. <clears throat> Jesus refers to this Old Testament passage, and he says, you know, do you remember when Moses at the burning bush stood before that appearance of God and the voice said, I am the God of Abraham, of your father Abraham, and of Isaac and of Jacob? And what does that mean? Well, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're still alive, and they still have their same identity. When you get to heaven, you don't, I've heard preachers say, you know, you have a brand new identity. You're not the same person anymore as you were on earth. You won't have any of those earthly relationships. That's just not true. Because this one passage that Jesus quoted shows that that's not true. Uh, you'll have those same earthly uh, loved ones that, are, that you, knew, you knew down here. You'll know them up there. In fact, we'll know each other even better up there. We'll love each other even better. <clears throat> and we'll still have that same kind of bond, father and son, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God didn't say to Moses, you know, they were your father and grandfathers before they died, but now they've, are, their identity's changed and you won't know them. That's not what God said. No, there's still Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're still in the family tree. They're still your fathers, and they're alive here in heaven, which means that we will keep our identities. We will know each other. In fact, we will know people that we've never met before, and we'll know them because we'll see them. Jesus said that. Jesus said, you know, we're going to sit down at the table with all the Old Testament saints. We're going to sit down with Isaac and Jacob and Abraham and Enoch and Noah and all the others. You say, how do you know you're going to know them? I don't know. I just know we're going to know them. We're going to know each other. We're going to have the same identity. And that means that our loved ones that are already there waiting on us, we'll know them. As soon as we see them, we'll know them. There'll be that wonderful reunion. In fact, Paul said that to the Thessalonians. They were afraid that some of their dead loved ones missed the second coming. And Paul said, oh, no, at the day of resurrection, they're going to rise first. And we're all going to be caught up together in heaven. And we're going to have a great reunion. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That wouldn't be a comfort to me if all of my loved ones that have gone on, if I no longer know who they are or their identity, that wouldn't be a comfort. It would only be a comfort 
if we're reunited as loved ones in heaven, there will be a resurrection. There will be a wonderful reunion there in heaven. But then there's one other thing I would have you see in this passage. Theology matters because many have misinterpreted Scripture. It matters because it's important to Jesus. It matters because your salvation is dependent on it. It matters because it will determine how we face life and death. Knowing that there will be a resurrection, that we will be reunited, should encourage us to be faithful to Christ here and now and to serve him. But here's number five. It matters because the Bible is God's inspired word. There's one more point I would give you here in this dialogue with the, uh, that Jesus had with these Sadducees. Notice in verse 26 again where he says, As touching the dead, that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. I want you to see how Jesus thought about the Scripture. Jesus believed that the Bible was the inspired word of God. He believed every word of the Scripture. And his whole argument that he gives towards the Sadducees is based on one word. It's the word M. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now think about this. Remember I said the Sadducees, they only believed the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe any of the rest of the Old Testament canon. They didn't believe the prophets and the writings. You know, the Old Testament is divided into three sections, law, prophets, writings. They believed the law, the first five books, but they didn't believe the rest of it. So when Jesus gives his argument that there is a resurrection, what does he quote from? He quotes from the first five books of the Bible. He quotes from Exodus, this narrative here where God says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And again, his whole argument is based on that word am. God didn't say I was the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but they're dead now. No, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What does that imply? They're still alive. They're all alive. There's life after death. So Jesus not only believed in verbal inspiration, he believed in the the very verbs of Scripture were inspired of God. The present tense verb is the, is the whole hinge on which his argument turns here. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the Bible says that in Matthew's account of this, that when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished that Jesus was so skillful with the Scripture and his whole argument was based on that one verb that proves there's life after death, There will be a resurrection. Luke's gospel says some of the scribes came to him and said, good sermon. That was really good. Now there's a division among the religious leaders because some of them said, yeah, he's right. And you know what the Bible says about the Sadducees? They didn't ask him any more questions after that. They were done. Because of his brilliance, Jesus was able to answer them. And this is why I do not hesitate as a preacher to preach to you the Word of God and give you as clearly as possible the living Word of God and as as meticulous as possible to give you the right meaning of the Scripture because the power is in the Word of God. This is the very Word of God. This is the authority. I have no authority, but this is God's authority right here. And I speak to you the Word of God Because theology matters, sound theology matters, and sound theology is based on the Word of God, the correct interpretation of the Word of God. It will determine how we live our life, how we conduct our life. John Payton was a great missionary to the New Hebrides. When he was called to go there, there this was a place where there were cannibals. Two other missionaries had gone there, and they had been killed by these natives. And friends around John Payton, Peyton were telling him, don't go because you will be, you'll be killed and, and you'll be eaten by cannibals. And this is what Peyton said. He said, I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it makes no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. Because in the great day of my resurrection, my resurrection body will be as fair as yours when I rise in the likeness of the Redeemer. 
It was his belief in the resurrection that gave him the boldness and the courage to serve his Lord the way he desired. And it should do the same for us. Let's bow for prayer together. And I would ask you, friend, with heads bowed and eyes closed, are you absolutely certain that you've put your faith in the, the living, risen Christ and you know him as your Savior? And if you, or you're not sure, would you just pray right where you are, whether you're here in the auditorium or you're listening on live stream, wherever you are? Would you pray and put your faith in the risen Christ, knowing that there's going to be life after this life, life after death, eternal life is available to those who put their faith in him, in his work on the cross. Would you say these words in your heart, Lord Jesus, I know that you are the Savior and the Lord, the resurrected Son of God, in this very moment, I put all of my faith in what you have done for me on the cross. And I receive the gift of salvation that you offer to me. Save me, Lord Jesus. Forgive me for my sin. And if you pray that and mean it, friend, you will be a Christian by the authority of the Word of God, I tell you. He will save you. He will forgive you for your sins. He will give you eternal life. And if you've done that, let us know. We want to encourage you along in your, your Christian walk. Father, again, thank you for your word, for the power of Scripture. Help us, Lord, to live accordingly, we pray in Jesus' name.